Hi, welcome back to our machine learning course. So far, we have been looking at how neural networks uh, work. Now we'll see how we can implement them in practice. Now, there are many practical courses on how to program or uh, develop neural networks. And there's just a few links here. I definitely recommend uh, the, the Fast AI course, uh, which is based on PyTorch. Uh, in this uh, video, we'll, look, we'll use Keras. So Keras is a general API for building neural networks. And it's currently also the default kind of absorbed into TensorFlow. Um, we'll focus mainly not on the details of how TensorFlow or PyTorch work, but we'll focus on the key design decisions that you need to make uh, when you develop or you design a neural network. And we'll use Keras because it has a very nice uh, general uh, API, so we can just reason about the, the high-level aspects. Uh, throughout this um, video, we'll use Fashion Amnist as an example. So Fashion Amnist, if you haven't heard of it before, it's a simple data set which has 28 by 28 images of different items of clothing like sandals, trousers, and pullovers, and we'll use a dense neural network to actually recognize these images. You may realize that this is not the best way to do things, uh, for that we will look at convolutional neural networks in the next video, uh, but for now I will use it as a, as a nice uh, intuitive example. Okay, so first of all we need to build the network. Uh, there are different ways you can do that, but the Keras interface uh, builds it layer by layer. So first of all we need to choose the type of model we want, in this case we use a sequential model. Sequential just means that it's just layer after layer and there's no branching or anything funny going on. Uh, our first layer is a dense layer, which has 512 nodes. Relative activation, and we use the hand normal uh, initializer of the weights because we have rel here. I don't think it makes a huge difference if you just remove this. It will use uh, the row by, by default, and it will probably also work fine. Uh, the input shape uh, or input layer is um, a flattened 28 by 28. Uh, layer. So although our images are uh, images of 28 by 28, we just flatten that into a one-dimensional vector uh, so we can feed it easily into our, our layers here. Uh, we have two of these dense layers and then our final layer has 10 classes, 10 nodes for 10 classes and of course uses the softmax activation function um, because we want to classification with it. Right? So if you would draw that, we will have uh, basically one very large 28 by 28, that's like 740 something, right? Anyway, it's 28 by 28 times 28 times 28 uh, pixels, the input layer. And then we have a large enough input vector with 512 nodes, another dense layer of 512 nodes, and then, because we have 10 outputs, our last layer will have 10 nodes, one for each class. So this one will be for I don't know, shoes, sandals, pullovers, and so on. Right? So each of these output layers corresponds to one class. Right? This is ReLU. Probably 10 inch will work well here as well, which is faster with ReLU. And we use softmax here because we have a classification problem. Right. Um, why did I choose two dense layers of this size? Well, because this is something that is probably over-dimensionalized. There's probably too many weights for now. Uh, later on, we'll see whether we can reduce that. But in general terms, two layers give you a reasonably good start. And the first layer should be more or less the same. Um, um, yeah scale as the input size here. So this was 700 something, so I'm keeping it to 512, which should be large enough. Okay, so that, that's our simple uh, neural network. Next, so yeah, if we, if we type network summary, we can get a summary, and this will present to us uh, the shape. So we have one dense layer, 512, another dense layer with 512 nodes, and finally, uh, again, a dense layer with 10 nodes. Um, if you look at the number of parameters in this model, well, our first dense layer 
as an input of 28 times 28 plus 1 bias times 512, right? These are all the connections between these two layers here. And so, and all these connections between these two layers. So it's 25 times 20, 28 plus 1 bias uh, times all the possible combinations with this one. And that yields uh, about 400,000 uh, weights to learn, weights and biases to learn. And the second layer is just 512 plus 1 bias times 512. That's about 262,000. And the final layer is 512 plus 1 bias times 10 output nodes. That's 5,000. So in total, we have about 670,000 parameters to learn. All right. Um, now we can choose a loss function optimizer and metrics. A loss function, because we do cross validation, this is typically cross entropy. Uh, we will use the normal categorical cross entropy. And this one requires uh, that our inputs, or sorry, our labels, are one of the coded. Right? So our final layer has these 10 output nodes. And our true label will be a one hat vector, which will have all zeros except for one, one in here, right? So if, we'll come back to this, but if for instance, your, the true class is four, you would encode this as a vector where um, zero, one, two, three, four is hot, a one, and the other ones are just zeros. Okay. Um, yeah, so, if we use cross entropy, um, this loss function, then the layers here must be one of the encoded. It will probably give you an error if it's not. Um, if you use binary cross entropy, that's a bit different because there you only have one output node, right? So you have, um, if you would have, if this is your final layer and you have a binary problem, then you could represent it by two output nodes, but in practice we use one, okay? Um, and then this one node can learn if it's close to one, it's a positive plus, if it's close to zero, it's a negative plus. Uh, this does mean that it's slight, it uses a slightly different loss function, so we have to use binary cross entropy if you want to do that, right? So whenever you use a binary problem, only use one output node and use binary cross entropy as loss function. And there's one more thing, it's called sparse categorical cross entropy. And that's whenever your labels are encoded one, two, three, four, five, and so on. So if you don't want to encode these, but you use the original uh, integer representation, you can do that, but then you have to use sparse categorical cross entropy as the loss function. When do you actually want to do that? Typically only when uh, you have a very, very large number of classes. Because, well, say that you have 100,000 classes, then this large, this nth vector will be very, very large. You have many, 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 many ways to learn. And this will also consume a lot of memory, right? So there are, there are cases where you don't want that and you actually want to represent the, uh, the, the class by a single node. And then you, your algorithm, your model has to learn to predict one, two, three, four, five, six, which is harder than learning to predict zero, one. Uh, but yeah, it, it's still doable. And but you typically only want to do this whenever you have a very large number of classes. Okay, uh, for the optimizer, um, you can use any of the optimizers we discussed before. I will use Armas Prop for now. And the metric is the metric we use to. Uh, evaluate the model at the end, and for that I will use accuracy for simplicity. Of course, in real life, you would probably want to use something that's more catered to your problem, like a cost function or position recall, depending on what your application is. Um, now, in KRS, we can represent this in one line of code. We can call Metro Compile, where we set the loss function, get a global cost entropy, our optimizers are as prop, and our metric is an array which has only accuracy. Right, so you can do this in, in one line, and most of the common loss functions optimizers have a string representation, so you can easily fill that out. 
If you want more control, you can also enter the actual uh, components. So if you want to have course entropy with smoothing, you can do it by creating a course entropy object and setting the label smoothing to some um, value that you find useful. Remember, label smoothing was done to avoid uh, overly optimistic um, predictions by the, the softmax function. Right? Um, for the optimizer, so I can use default armors prop. If I want to add momentum, I can do that. So maybe I want to, yeah, I should have something here like 0 0.9. Um, and I can also change the learning rate. Now, typically, you don't have to do this um, because armors prop will learn its own learning rates. So you can totally leave the default, and the main decision is here whether you want to have momentum or not. Now, the pen, you can still get better performance by tuning this learning rate, especially in the beginning. Like you, it, it may help sometimes to give a slightly larger learning rate, depending on the problem. And yeah, I can also replace the string accuracy by any uh, function that computes an evaluation metric. So if you have your metric, you, you can also put it in here. Like if you have a cost function uh, that's related to some business goals, you can fill it in here. Okay, um, we have to do a bit of pre-processing before we can train on that. First of all, we always need to normalize our data. When I mean normalize, I mean either standardize, right? So bring all the data uh, around zero and standard deviation one. So all the data points should be in this space here. Or min max, so bring all the values between uh, zero and one. Okay, uh, the main goal here is to bring the mean close to zero. Why this has to do with, uh, especially like um, gradient, vanishing gradients and uh, exploding gradients. You definitely don't want to have some inputs overpower others, right? So remember that, especially in the input layer, uh, you have your input layer X and you will a node here will be influenced by all these different uh, inputs. If you have one input here, which is a lot larger than the others, this will have a big effect. Even if it has a small weight, it will have a big effect on the activation in the next layers. Uh, that will mean that you will get a zigzagging behavior right, in the direction. So if you have this weight here, right? In the direction of this weight, because it has such a large effect, uh, it will have big gradient updates. You get it cannot make a, a small step unless the learning rate for some reason is very very small. Um, so it will start zigzagging uh, if your um, data is not normalized nicely, especially with outliers. It can have this effect. Um, yeah, this is here. And yeah, also if you're, if the gradients of the activation functions are near zero, we saw that for, for instance, um, 10H, right? For, for 10H, the, the, the derivative um, of 10H looks something like this, right? And so if you have a large input value X, the derivative will be near zero, which will cause your gradients to vanish, as we discussed before. Right? So that's another reason why you want to um, always normalize your data before you give it to a neural net. It's a no-brainer, like always do that. Okay, next we need to reshape our data to fit the shape of our input layer. Right? This is something particular to neural nets, while most algorithms that we see before, like trees and SVMs, they don't care what the data looks like, they just, it has to be featureized. Um, while neural nets have specific demands on how the input should look like. Right? It, it, so you need to basically fit the data to the input shape. Right? Um, so it can be either like one vector, or it can be uh, a matrix, it can be a tensor. Uh, it really depends on your application. 
But in any case, you should um, reshape the data so it fits the input layer. Typically, um, well, almost, the first dimension is the dimension of the samples. Right? So if you have 10 samples, this will be 10. And then this is the number of values per sample you have. Um, whereas in our case, we have a data set with 60,000 examples and every image is squashed into one vector of 20 by 28. Right? And our NumPy reshape will take care of that. Uh, for normalization, I just do simple, I just, uh, th these are pixel values between 0 and, and 255, so I just divide by 255, which will bring them between 0 and 1. It's just a very simple thing. Uh, finally, we uh, are doing multi-class classification, so as we said before, we want to one hot encode the labels, so class 4 becomes uh, a vector of 10 values with a 1, uh, which is hot with the corresponding class. And there's a function called two categorical in KRS, which does it for you. Okay, um, then we need to ch choose our training parameters. Uh, when we train, we call network fit. Uh, and we have to choose the number of epochs. That's the number of complete runs we uh, do of our data set. So we, we go three times through our entire data set. And we go through it in batches of 32. So every time we take 32 samples, uh, we pass through the network at a forward pass, we backpropagate, we give again 32 um, instances, we backpropagate, and we keep doing it over and over again. Uh, we had about 60,000 uh, examples. I forget what the data set, the training set size was. Um, but we divide this in batches of 32, so each epoch will have about 1,875 iterations, and each iteration has 32 instances. And after those 1,875 uh, passes, you have gone through this at one time. And since epoch is three, we'll do that three times in a row. Right? So this is the output of the fit function. Uh, so it basically gives you, if you run this, you will see a live updating uh, as it goes through all these epochs and all these batches. Um, an interesting question is, what's the optimal size of the batch size? Typically, overall, by and large, um, the best values are small. Something like 32, 64, whatever. Right? Um, this has one downside, uh, because if you take small batches, Typically, convergence is a bit slower. Right? If you have a simple problem, you can have a very large batch size, like 600, and it will cause train to be faster. You need to have fewer passes to the networks to optimize your weights. Uh, but um, the reason why we typically like smaller batch sizes in general is that it introduces some noise in our data, right? Our network has to deal with only 32 examples per pass, uh, and this makes overfitting on the training set less likely, right? Because there's, well, you only look at 32 examples at a time, and um, so, well, if you would look at your grade updates, there will be probably a bit zigzagging a bit more with small batch sizes. Uh, but it would less likely overfit to the exact data set that you're dealing with. It's actually observed that if you use a very large batch size, that you get a generalization gap. It means that if you would look at the learning curve, uh, so this is uh, validation loss, and this is the number of batches or epochs, and you use a large learning rate, so a large batch size, so batch large, you will end up at a certain optimal loss. If you use a smaller batch size, you typically, well, not sure if it's faster, uh, but you end up slower. It's definitely possible that it's slower, uh, but in the end, uh, surpasses uh, the batch size. No matter, uh, the main idea is that with smaller batches, 
you uh, will get this gap here. You will get a you will get an improvement in the loss that you can only get with smaller batches, even if you even if you have to train longer. Okay, this is called the the generalization gap. Another benefit of having small batches is that it requires less memory. Right? Remember that we need to push the data to the network and tensors. And these need to be stored in memory. Uh, so if you have small batches, you need less memory to do that. Uh, so if you are dealing with GPUs, which have limited memory, you typically are constrained by the batch size. You cannot make it too large, otherwise you run out of, out of memory. Right. So uh, by and large, large batches do speed up training. So your learning curves will be um, faster going down. But when you uh, you may get this generalization gap, you may not get the optimal performance out of it. Um, and you may also run into uh, overfitting issues, which is the same thing. Uh, and you will also run into memory issues in GPUs. There's actually a very interesting paper um, that's linked here. Uh, it shows that bias interacts with learning rate. So it basically says that instead of shrinking the learning rate, as we do with uh, the SGDDK, um, you can just increase the batch size and have the same benefit. OK, um, once you've fitted the network, we can now start predicting. So we can call predict with some test set. And we get predictions. In this case, we have like one example, and we'll see that. Well, remember it has ten outputs, right? So each of these has a number. This is zero point zero two. This one has zero point zero 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 two. This one has zero point eight eight, and so on, right? So definitely, um, this output here is much hotter than the other ones, right? So it predicts with about 0.88 output uh, value that uh, this is class number uh, two. Zero, one, two. Right. Um, yeah, and the true label is correct, right? So in, indeed, that's the correct class to predict. We can also just call evaluate on a test set, and then we'll get uh, whatever performance metric you want. In this case, it's accuracy. So our model is about 87% accurate.